this might be a good place to uh to mention the uh the eloquent and the insightful tweet of the great and the powerful Andre Karpathy. Uh I think he had a bunch of thoughts, but one of them last thought, not sure if this is obvious. You know something profound is coming when you're saying it's not sure if it's obvious. There are two major types of learning in both children and in deep learning. There's one, imitation learning, watch and repeat, i.e. pre-training, supervised fine tuning, and two, trial and error learning, reinforcement learning. My favorite simple example is AlphaGo. One is learning by imitating expert players. Two is reinforcement learning to win the game. Almost every single shocking result of deep learning and the source of all magic is always two. Two is significantly more powerful. Two is what surprises you. Two is when the paddle learns to hit the ball behind the blocks and break out. Two is when AlphaGo beats even Lee Sedol. And two is the aha moment when the, the deep seek or O1, et cetera, discovers that it works well to reevaluate your assumptions, backtrack, try something else, et cetera. It's the solving strategies you see this model use in its chain of thought. It's how it goes back and forth thinking to itself. These thoughts are emergent, three exclamation points. And this is actually seriously incredible, impressive and new, and is publicly available and documented. The model could never learn this with uh, imitation because the cognition of the model and the cognition of the human labeler is different. The human would never know to correctly annotate these kinds of solving strategies and what they should even look like. They have to be discovered during reinforcement learning as empirically and statistically useful towards the final outcome. Anyway, the alpha zero sort of uh, metaphor analogy here. Uh, can you speak to that, the yeah. magic of the chain of thought that he's referring to? Um, I think it's good to recap AlphaGo and AlphaZero because it plays nicely with these analogies between imitation learning and learning from scratch. So AlphaGo, the beginning of the process was learning from humans where they had, they started the first, this is the first expert level Go player or chess player in DeepMind series of models where they had some human data. And then the, why it is called AlphaZero is that there was hu zero human data in the loop. And that change to alpha zero made a model that was dramatically more powerful for DeepMind. So this remove of the human prior, the, the human inductive bias, makes the final system far more powerful. This we mentioned bitter lesson hours ago, and this is all aligned with this. And then there's been a lot of discussion in language models. This is not new. This goes back to the whole Q star rumors, which if you piece together the pieces, is probably the start of OpenAI figuring out its O1 stuff when last year in November the QSTAR rumors came out. There's a lot of intellectual drive to know when is something like this going to happen with language models because we know these models are so powerful and we know it has been so successful in the past. And it is a reasonable analogy that this new type of reinforcement learning training for reasoning models is when the door is open to this. We don't yet have the equivalent of turn 37, which is the famous turn where the DeepMind's AI playing Go stumped Lee Sedol completely. We don't have something that's that level of focal point, but that doesn't mean that the approach to technology is different and the impact of the general training is still incredibly new. Well, what do you think that point would be? What will, will be move 37 for chain of thought, for reasoning? Scientific discovery. Like when you use this sort of reasoning problem and it just something we fully don't expect. I think it's actually probably simpler than that. It's probably something related to computer user robotics uh, rather than science mm -hmm. discovery. Um, because the, the important aspect here is uh, models take so much data to learn, they're not sample efficient, right? Trillions, they take the entire web, right? Over 10 trillion tokens to train on, right? Um, this would take a human thousands of years to read, right? A human does not... And and and, know, and humans know most of the stuff, a lot of the stuff models know better than it, right? Humans are way, way, way more sample efficient. And that is because of the self-play, right? How does a baby learn what its body is? As it sticks its foot in its mouth and it says, oh, this is my body, right? <laughs> it sticks its hand in its mouth and it calibrates its touch on its fingers with the most sensitive touch thing on its tongue, right? Like it's how babies learn. Um, and, 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 and it's just self-play over and over and over and over again. And now we have something that is similar to that, right? With these uh, verifiable uh, proofs, right? Whether it's a unit test in code or a mathematical verifi ver verifiable task, 
generate many traces of reasoning, right? Um, and keep branching them out, keep branching them out. And then check the, at the end, hey, which one actually has the right answer? Most of them are wrong. Great. These are the few that are right. Maybe we use some sort of reward model outside of this to select even the best one to preference as well. But now you've started to get better and better at these uh, benchmarks. And so you've seen over the last six months, a skyrocketing in a lot of different benchmarks, right? All math and code benchmarks were pretty much solved, except for frontier math, which is designed to be almost questions that aren't practical to most people because they're like they're exam level open math problem type things so it's like on the math problems that are somewhat reasonable which is like somewhat complicated word problems or coding problems it's just what dylan is saying so, so, so the thing here is that these are only with verifiable tasks. You, we earlier showed an example of the, you know, the really interesting, like what happens when chain of thought is to a non-verifiable thing. Mm -hmm. It's just like a human, you know, chatting, right? With the, you know, thinking about what's novel for humans, right? A unique thought. Uh, but this task and form of training only works when it's infinite, when it's verifiable. Um, and from here, the thought is, okay, we can continue to scale this current training method by increasing the number of verifiable tasks. Um, in math and coding, coding probably has a lot more to go. Math has a lot less to go in terms of what are verifiable things. Can I create a solver that then I generate tra uh, trajectories toward or traces towards, reasoning traces towards, and then prune the ones that don't work and keep the ones that do work? Well, those are going to be solved pretty quickly. But even if you've solved math, you have not actually created intelligence, right? Um, and so this is where I think the like aha moment of computer use or robotics will come in because now you have a sandbox or a playground that is infinitely verifiable, right? Did you, you know, messing around on the internet, there are so many actions that you can do that are verifiable. It'll start off with like log into a website, create an account, click a button here, blah, blah, blah. But it'll then get to the point where it's, hey, go do a task on Tasker or whatever these other, all these various task websites. Hey, go get uh, hundreds of likes, right? Um, and and the and it's going to fail. It's going to spawn hundreds of accounts. It's going to fail on most of them. But this one got to a thousand. Great. Now you've reached the verifiable thing. And you just keep iterating this loop over and over. And that's when. And same with robotics, right? That's where you know where you have an infinite playground of tasks. Like, hey, did I put the ball in the bucket? All the way to like, oh, did I like build a car? Right. Like, you know, there's a whole trajectory to speed run, or you know, what models can do. But at some point, I truly think that like you know, we'll spawn models and initially all the training will be in sandboxes. But then at some point, you know, the language model pre-training is going to be dwarfed by what is this reinforcement learning? You know, you'll, you'll pre-train a multimodal model that can see, that can read, that can write, you know, blah, 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 whatever, vision, audio, et cetera. But then you'll have it play in a sandbox infinitely right. and we'll figure out, figure out math, figure out code, figure out navigating the web, figure out operating a robot arm. Right. right. And then it'll learn so much. And the aha moment, I think, will be when this is available to then create something that's not good, right? Like, oh, cool. Part of it was like figuring out how to use the web. Now, all of a sudden, it's figured out really well how to just get hundreds of thousands of followers that are real and real engagement on Twitter, because all of a sudden, this is one of the things that are verifiable. And maybe not just engagement, but make money. Yes. Like become an, I mean, that could be the thing where almost fully automated, it makes you know, $10 million by being an influencer, selling a product, creating the product, like, and, and I, I'm not referring to like a hype product, but an actual product where like, holy shit, this thing created a business. It's running it. It's the face of the business, that kind of thing. Maybe, or maybe a number one song, like it creates the whole infrastructure required to create the song, to be the influencer that represents that song, that kind of thing, and makes a lot of That could be the move. I mean, this our culture respects money in that kind of way. And it's and it's verifiable, right? It's verifiable, <laughs> right. The, the bank account can't lie. <laughs> exactly. There is surprising evidence that once you set up the ways of collecting the verifiable domain that this can work. There's a, been a lot of research before this R1 on math problems, and they approach math with language models just by increasing the number of samples. So you can just try again and again and again, and you look at the amount of times that the language models get it right. And what we see is that even very bad models get it right sometimes. And the whole idea behind reinforcement learning is that you can learn from very sparse rewards. So it it doesn't, the, the space of language and the space of tokens, whether you're generating language or tasks for a robot is so big that you might say that it's like, I mean, each, the tokenizer for a language model can be like 200,000 things. So at each, each step, it can sample from that big of a space. So if it can generate a bit of a signal that it can climb onto, that's the, what the whole field of RL is around is learning from sparse rewards. 
And the same thing has played out in math where it's like very weak models that sometimes generate answers. We see research already that you can boost their math scores. You can do this sort of RL training for math. It might not be as effective, but if you take a 1 billion parameter model, so something 600 times smaller than DeepSeq, you can boost its grade school math scores very directly with a small amount of this training. So it's not to say that this is coming soon. Setting up the verification domains is extremely hard and there's a lot of nuance in this, but there are some basic things that we have seen before where it's like it's at least expectable that there's a domain and there's a chance that this works.